You're listening to Biz Souls, the business podcast with an edge, hosted by me, Rona Lewis, and Jeffrey Hansler. Tune in for perspectives and discoveries about the changing world of business. It's time to connect to the heart, soul, and humor of how business gets done. All right. Welcome to Biz Souls. I'm Rona Lewis. I'm Jeffrey Hansler. He almost forgot. Who are you? Why are well, we here? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we get to the heart and soul of business and the people that make it happen. And we have a wonderful happener here uh, today. Yes, Stefan. I'm going to, I have to ingl- anglicize it. Uh, Derringer? Am Sorry. I close? You, you say it as beautifully. It's great to be Thank here, Rana. Wonderful, wonderful. Jeffrey, great to be here. Thanks for having me. And of I'm course. loving your chair. Um, I'm loving your chair and your background there. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love the That's fun. fabulous. You know, if it's um, only if it's only the chair in the background, if we get the dog barking in the background, then we're going to Oh, have I have one too, so we're all yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let me do my official introduction. You are the founder, I need my my glasses for this, of SKT Global, formerly the Human Innovation Garage, which I actually really like that that name, as well as a serial <laughs> entrepreneur, multiple CEO, personal futurist, executive coach and investor. You were named a 2023 top 30 global coaching guru, claiming a seat next to Jack Canfield, Tony Robbins, John Matone, and ICF, that's International Coaching Federation, is that what that is? Mm -hmm. Uh, President Dr. Marsha Reynolds. In 2021, you were named the pioneering face of human innovation, and in February 2020, You were recognized as a world 101 top coaching leader by the World Human Resource Conference and the World Coaching Congress, among many other accolades. We'd be here all day, basically. So um, welcome. I'm very excited that that you were willing um, to do this. Stefan and I met on Lunch Club uh, a little while ago, and we had a wonderful conversation. I was like, yo, you got to come on our podcast. So and and he understood me because he lives in New York part of the time. So I was very excited about that. <laughs> I certainly understood so. that, and I'm not sure who needs to be more grateful that I'm here and you grateful or me grateful for you letting me on the your podcast. Oh, we're definitely we grateful well, because again. we've gotten sick of each other. So you know, yeah, any, any guests like, to come I in for us to, put, down. to do good behavior. <laughs> so yeah, I will try. I promise you. So um, tell us about, uh, talk about your, your background a little bit. You know, background, is a, that's a loaded question. So I grew up in Germany, uh, mm-hmm. in Stuttgart, Germany, actually in the city. Um, and my dad was, and I think we, we spoke in the, in the, uh, in the uh, pre, pre-pod a little bit about it. My dad was a politician. Um, so I still, with great fondness, uh, know history and connect to the history and to the city today in Stuttgart. And my uh, brother and I still today co-own a house in the city, which nice. is our parents' house. Um, grew up there and then um, in the early 90s came to the United States. So I was a hospitality guy, uh, was working in hospitality management. I think the important part here is um, experience and human experience and people and people experience and how to uh, you know, catalyze people and inspire people and motivate people on both sides, internal in the hotel, but also external. How do you, you know, the retention of a customer, of a client, um, and everything that goes with that was kind of inherently uh, taught to me through hospitality management school, through the hospitality itself. And in uh, the early 90s, I came to Ritz-Carlton Hotels in Boston, which was the original Ritz-Carlton for Ritz-Carlton Corporation, when we were only, at that time, 10, 11 hotels. Uh, Later, as uh, many of you and your listeners, I'm sure, know, got acquired by Marriott um, uh, Corporation. Um, and that was about the time when I left. Uh, last stint with hospitality for me was in New York. That's how I discovered New York, so to speak. Uh, funny story for you, I'll tell you in a second. But I, that's how I discovered New York, worked at the Waldorf Astoria there between 49 and 50th, right on Park Avenue. And um, from there, I went into education technology um, with a couple of guys we built in the late 90s in the learning management system. Boston was, for me, the first city that I resided in through the Ritz in Boston. It was kind of the comeback city. So that's predominantly with New York and then Stuttgart, uh, my, my place where I hang my hat. I'll stop here. No, no, that's questions. good. 
Uh, yeah, so that's great. I, so, how did you transition into coaching from? Uh, where I were is it, where, excuse me, I can talk this morning. <laughs> I just got over a cold, which is sometimes if you see me turn my head, it's because I'm trying to avoid sneezing into the mic or coughing. Well, that makes into it much mic. better. Thank you for that. Yeah. Well, I don't want to get the mic sick. Somewhere. You know how that goes. <laughs> so, uh, uh, did you make? Was it a multi-step transition into coaching, or was it a single step? You know, just take off. You know, I think it's a lifelong step, and I think when you in any business. Uh, there's a, uh, and I forgot the author, but there's a book written, everyone's a coach. And I think that's truth to that. And I think the question is, how do you approach people and how do you look to inspire people if that's in a leadership position or if you're designated or an undesignated leader? And um, when you ever read the book, which is an old marketing gem, uh, Tribes of Seth Gooden, what's so interesting is when you read this book, you start realizing that anybody can build a movement, anybody can uh, create inspiration and anybody can be a leader. And it doesn't require you to have the C of this chief executive or chief operating officer or whatever that may be at the front of your title. It's about how human beings connect. And let's go to present for a moment. I think when we today talk about soft skills and we talk today about what is really the most valuable asset a human being can bring to an organization, it's two things. It's empowerment and trust. And both of those are not built by systems and procedures or by policies and structures, what that's built is with human connection. So through hospitality, to now answer your question, and kind of that evolution of education impact and creating education access globally also in India, that human factor always consisted of being involved in that. And so coaching was something that I used to do you know, very early on. Um, I certainly did it in an organization like uh, Ritz-Carlton. I certainly did it in an organization like the Waldorf Astoria at the time was still owned by the Hilton family then within Hilton. And the transition was very easy. The question was for me, what is something that I really enjoy and that I'm really good at and nobody can take from me and I can make an impact, make impact on one, maybe on many, maybe many too many. And that's where coaching was kind of an inspiration for me to pursue further uh, about a little bit more than a decade ago. Excellent. You Sorry. You, you were just talking about human experience. How did you go from that to human innovation? What does that what does that mean and how do you work that in your in your coaching? You know, if you break down human innovation, as the company says, human innovation garage, and I still can't get around it. I was just in Guatemala uh, giving a keynote and human innovation garage, everybody goes, Oh my god, that's such a great name, and you just said it yourself. And a dear friend who I read a book about and wanted to be connected to him, who's a coach himself. Uh, very, very experienced. Um, he said, this is the greatest name he's ever heard. So it's hard for me to give that up. And I'll say in a moment, I'll tell you in a moment why I, I'm kind of switching a little bit. Um, but human is about, you know, all the various beauties and, and, and intricacies and brilliance we have within us. And everybody has different ones. And I think more than ever before, when I speak with people and when I talk to groups or in, in organizations and also to your listeners, it's really so important, I think, that we invite people to understand that humanity is just a beautiful thing. And all our quirks and shortfalls and over the top and curiosities and not so curiosities and all the ways we get triggered and not and whatever that makes you, you, very uniquely you, that's the human component. And then there's humanity, right? Humanity also in the context of kindness, being nice with each other. Because it's amazing, right? This old saying, you're going to get more with honey than with, uh, what's the uh, uh, honey? Uh, than vinegar. With vinegar. Than vinegar. I mean, guess what? Right? As human beings, we have all these little traumas and big traumas. And I talk in my practice about executive trauma, kind of what would we bring forward from past experiences. And I think that's a big part of that. So the innovation part is then recognizing all these various components and saying, hmm, Think about it like a Lego system. I mean, you can build Lego in all different shapes and formats. And Lego comes in all different shapes and formats. And that's kind of the human innovation piece, right? Innovation is something that is taking, um, and I'm going to get a little X-rated now, if I may. Uh, uh, raise Go your ahead. hands if you don't want me to do that. But I <laughs> always okay. tell people, no, we're good. We're innovation good. <laughs> is not something new. Innovation is taking something where there's maybe some original ideas. But if we put them together and we let them have sex, well, guess what? That's innovation, right? When ideas have sex, that's innovation. But it's not anything original. And if I can tell people the same thing in the context of 
educating them about themselves because everybody, this is the important thing to recognize about coaching anybody is everybody has inherently brilliant pieces. And if I'm able to guide you to actually mirror that to you and to say, look at this, what you actually got and allow you to take ownership of that, you're going to completely trans uh, uh, change your trajectory, but also it provides you a huge platform and opportunity for transformation. So that the last actually is garage um, is, is where we have, you know, just like you bring your car to the garage, there's tools, there's resources, there's frameworks. Uh, and I'm not a huge, let me rephrase this. It's not that I'm not a believer in frameworks, but there's a lot of young coaches. They take a framework and they say, we're going to walk you through this. And there's no flexibility. There's no adjustment. There's no right. uh, uh, real empathy. And because they're not at that point of having developed that capacity yet. But so that's a little bit the garage part. Right, right, right. Yeah. I'm thinking, um, you know, the minute you said micro uh, innovative garage, I'm thinking, okay, um, he's read Zen and motorcycle and the art of motorcycle maintenance. Motorcycle and maintenance. We talked. We talked about uh, you know the microcomputer industry, which started off in the garage, and I'm thinking, okay, Apple computer, and so you put those together, you get an innovative garage. So, uh, wait, I want to. I've got to ask this question before we go on. So a lot of people say, you know, Steve Jobs amazing for creating the iPhone. He was a, a brilliant thief. You know, he went and saw Xerox Park. He got the GUI interface from Xerox Park, and then the BlackBerry comes out, and he looks at the BlackBerry and he says, "I want to put I want to put my GUI interface on it," which means yeah. we got to get rid of the keyboard. So he it wasn't huge leaps. So, is there a uh, an exercise, or is there something that you could do to focus more on that? How do you put ideas together and create that? You know, or do you just relax and breathe out? You know, I think, I think you know, don't underestimate that. I mean, there's, a, there's an HBR study, a Harvard Business Review study years old, where every day take two, three hours and do nothing and just really be creative, whatever that may mean in the context of, um, let's call it reflection. I think the first step is, uh, so I, I invite people a lot to think about what's their vision, take some action on that vision, but also make sure and make the space to reflect. Right? Vision, action, reflection. We're very good at, you know, everybody goes to the weekend uh, uh, coffee session and creates vision boards and everybody talks about vision boards and let me tell you my vision. Good, check. And then let's take action. Let's take radical and intense action onto this. Excellent. And then we blow up and then we're afraid of actually looking back because out of a couple of reasons. A, failure is not sexy. And still in 2023, it's not sexy, even though uh, a, a colleague of mine and, and neighbor here of mine, Amy Edmondson, who is a Harvard professor, has written I about I love Amy failure, Edmondson. Yeah, yeah, for a long time. And we just had this conversation when I saw her at Thinkers 50 here in Boston. And, and the part is the environment that needs to exist. And, and the other part she talks about is, and she, she was the one started it 20 years ago, is psychological safety, right? And there's different formats of psychological safety. So what is the environment? What is the, the container I'm providing you where you just know it's safe? And it's not a particular zone in the corner of, of a building or a particular you know, corner in the, in the university, in the, in the hallway or anything else like that. It is literally going back to what we talked earlier, which is human interaction in the finest and kindest way. And, and that may be a little bit different things for different people, but overall it is something where it's about, you know, what's the trigger for me? How do I, and what's my self-awareness in regards to, and it's the basics of emotional intelligence, um, and how do I manage that? What's the self-management capacity I have? So to your question, so the first part is just, you know, dream, have some space, make some space. The second thing is, if you're thinking about more than two people, and it's three or four or five people, I think the important thing is, is allow for divergence, and then at some point, the agreement to converge. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sometimes a, a difficult exercise because hierarchy comes in and people also hear if their psychological safety doesn't exist, they will be afraid of being judged. If that's the colleague, if that's right. the boss, if that's not as valid what I say. So sometimes what I tell people instead of kind of what we call brainstorming, and that's a very simple first step, is do brain writing. And here's what the difference is. Uh, brain writing give me a little piece of paper, I'm going to write it on there, and then somebody collects it and then just sticks it on the wall because now nobody knows who said what. So now I'm going to have an equal playing field. 
So if that's the CEO or if that's uh, whoever it is in the in the in the company who wrote it down has the same value. Yeah. And yeah. that's I think the value we're attaching to uh, an exercise of creativity or brainstorming or opinions or feedback is always very very much attached to the hierarchy, the ranking, the title of the individual who gives that in an enterprise. And I think we're making a huge mistake because the smarts, when we think about kind of a hierarchy in an organization, we put the CEO at the top and then it kind of, you know, it runs downhill. Well, it should actually be the other way around because when you go into let's take Apple, you just brought Apple. The people I interact never have been Steve Jobs or never was Tim Cook. The people I interact with are the people who are in my pyramid, they're at the very top. That's the service people. It's kind of running down from there. So if we think about servant leadership, the CEO, the executive team sits at the bottom and becomes the enablers for anything that the organization and the respective divisions need to do in order to empower people to you know, execute on behalf of the highest possible impact and customer and client experience that in the philosophy and the overall mission of the company is being talked about. I'll stop, but I hope that yeah. answered your question. Yes, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all the things, and, and uh, Stefan, you and I talked about this when we when we first got together, how so much of literally what you just said is what I work with teaching teaching play because you can't you can't 100%. do anything and uh, you know without psychological safety. Yeah. And 100%. Uh, you know, and um Jeffrey and actually think, And I ahead. think the, the part if I may say this quickly with play the beauty of it is you know we I call it the kids growing up paradox, uh KGU paradox. Mm -hmm. And and what it is is we we're we're little kids and we all we're <laughs> playful, we explore, we want to touch, we want to feel, we want to bite, we want to smell, mm -hmm. we want to stick it in our ears and our nose and our mouth and it's then curiosity. Our parents, yeah. Exactly. And it's super healthy. And then our parents come along and at the age of eight, nine, 10, 11, we start hearing, don't do this, don't touch this, you can't do this, you don't do this. And cultural influences come in and, and, and societal influences come in. And then at the age of 16, like 10 years later, eight years later, we look at them and say, what's wrong with you? Why are you not more curious? Why are you not asking these questions? And X-rated again. And the kids should turn around and say, fuck you. You <laughs> told me 10 years ago not to touch this, not to touch that. And now you want me to do it? What is wrong with you? What's the yeah. message here? And it's we, not we as beat easy. that uh, childlike one hundred percent thought process, you know, out of it when we're and, still kids. And then we create this this you know this this continuation in in corporate, where where you know you keep going along, and there's a beautiful Ellen Watts parody on this. You know, you go up, and then the bag is empty, and you become the CEO, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think we got to remind ourselves on that what life is really all about and what is you know what represents joy for us and right if you ask 10 people what's success a lot of people will i mean first of on 10 people you're going to get 25 different versions but the other part is also i think there's a there's a wrong attachment to materialistic things and we don't really in in western society in particular have a good understanding what happiness can really be absolutely and i don't and i'm not i'm, I'm not the guy to claim that i have all the answers on that I think that's a perpetual journey for me as well, but I, I know it's not it's not the million yeah. dollars in the bank or anything else. And for me, that didn't change anything. Well, we did and have uh, Ricky yeah. Powell on, what, a couple of months ago, who is a happiness coach. <laughs> yeah, uh, can I get his information? No, but uh, <laughs> jokes aside, it's it's one of those things. I think it's a, and I think it's an individual, a very individual. Absolutely. Journey, so. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's there, there, there are so many variables for, you know, how we grew up, who we interacted with, um, and how much we were allowed to be kids, you 100%. know, um, the, um, Stuart Brown, who uh, wrote the, the, the ultimate book on, on play, you know, he was a, a researcher and found that, um, he researched murderers and sociopaths, psychopaths, and all found that they weren't allowed to play as, as kids. And it really messes up the mind, you know, and yeah, 100%. um, so it's, it, it's really important. Yep. Jeffrey, did you want to get a word in? No, no, I'm over something? here just uh, <laughs> uh, uh, trying to breathe. Uh, 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 Stefan, uh, is there a specialty they bring you in for, or is there an area you focus on, or do you focus with more groups or do you focus with individuals 
And is it leadership? It's really a balance. Um, so I started mostly with individuals simply because I didn't have the reach and people got to know me. But now oftentimes I come in when there's group dynamics and, and it's oftentimes kind of an executive team where we have multiple dynamics, multiple players. Sometimes it's a change management uh, uh, trajectory that is um, about to happen or has just happened where you know various executive teams are being replaced slash new people are being brought in. And um, that's kind of my, my sweet spot is really uh, the chessboard when two, three, four people are uh, not communicating, let's leave it at that for the moment, the way they should in order to be highly effective in their positions for a variety of reasons. Uh, and that is something that is blatantly obvious to either the board or to the executive committee member that has reached out. Um, and, and it's simply, you know, it's, uh, I never come in, I'll tell you what I never come in for is how to tell people how to do their job. While I've been CEO, while I've done that, I'm not a business coach. I really come in about human dynamics. That's the absolute 100% focus. Interesting. So what do you feel um, most executive coaches, because there's, I mean, that is such a, a big title, you know? So what do you think they may be missing um, when they perform their, their jobs or, you know, they don't, when they don't really know what they're doing, I guess, is what I'm asking. What do you think? Well, I, I, you know, I think it's hard to say, does somebody know or not know what they're doing? I think everybody, every coach has their place, but I think the, the, the <coughs> contemporary uh, 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 appearance of time is that everybody wants to be a coach these days. There is more coaches than probably we have lawyers right now. Yeah. yeah. And I think that makes the field of, let's call it potential clients or people who seek support and service of a coach, and I distinctly say that service and support uh, makes that very, very congested and very, very difficult. And I always compare it with when I built my last uh, uh, successful startup in India, we were uh, supporting colleges in India. And when you've ever been to that part of the world, you know, as you drive down any street in a rural area, you will find on five miles, you'll find 10 colleges. And nobody knows, is it a good college or not? Or is it qualified? Is it accredited or et cetera, et cetera, because the privatization of education there is significant. And that's what I compare sometimes coaching to, because it's really, really hard through all the noise to find somebody that can serve you if you don't get a personal introduction or a reference or there's word of mouth out there or some neutral <laughs> recognition, essentially, that says, you know what, that's somebody who you should probably talk to. That doesn't mean that's the right person for you, but explore that. I think the first, the biggest thing I always, always say to people is this. A lot of coaches, when they start, A, I think some of them, I would say, they undercharge for what they're worth because they are catering entirely to the other side, which is important, but, and there is a but intentionally, they're not willing to take the chance to actually challenge the client to a point where the client may actually get a little bit uncomfortable because they're more concerned about losing the client and the $150 an hour that they charge and they need to make that money in order to continue rather than actually like a restaurant. Think about a new restaurant. Guy makes up, opens up a new restaurant. Well, people will need to learn about it. When you go to the restaurant the first time, you kind of go, oh, that was really good. If it's the second time good again, you go, that's a consistently good restaurant. If you go the second time and it's no good, you're going to try it the third time. And no good in coaching is not being challenged. No good in coaching is not poking that person in the face and saying, hey, let me t let me show you what's happening right here. And challenging them to a point of thinking that they ultimately find what they came here for in the first place. Well, and one of the things that I was just looking for it on my desk, I have this beautiful quote, it's a Buddhist aphorism. It's called, it's, it says, you've come here to find what you already have inside. And that's that what sense. coaching is already all about. Because there is an underlying silence we've we've created going back to what we talked earlier kind of the kids growing up uh, uh, paradox and underlying silence like we gotta open that up and and that's i think the biggest part right it's kind of like this book from hermiana ibar which is act like a leader think like a leader act go out be spontaneous be you be gregarious be whatever it is who you are 
find your place in the world. Don't be a conformist and that makes you safe and, and, and waste your life, your time, your corporate career, whatever else it is away. Right. Yeah, I don't know what that's like being myself. Do I, Jeffrey? No, absolutely not. <laughs> Rona, you, you always have, you, you're I'm, never yourself. I'm so shy and quiet. <laughs> um, Stefan, uh, uh, so unfortunately we're running out of time we're on running this. Running out of time. Uh, uh, how would somebody, how uh, could, what are some recommendations for picking coaches? So how do you pick the right coach for you? Uh, how do you, there are some charlatans out there that say they know coaching and they really are not self-aware. And so they're not able, because they're not self-aware, they may not offer a lot of value to somebody. I think, you know, like any interview you go to, be also the interviewer. Uh, I think that's the piece. Uh, make sure that individual, depending on um, your next version of you or what you aspire to be, they have a little bit of a trajectory shown where um, they are at peace, whatever that means for them that you can relate to. Um, and I think the biggest part is if you get an introduction from somebody who says, hey, this is somebody you should work with, there's a high likelihood that this individual who recommended that individual has a reason why they recommend that particular individual, either because they think there is a part in it that can help you because they know you, or it is something that they've experienced themselves, which they relate to you. And that's why they're recommending that individual as well. So that's the first piece. The second part or the second piece, the third piece is, uh, you know, just talk to various people and allow yourself. I think the other part that I always tell people, we, we are animals of, and we're creatures of nature. And I think our gut, our instinct will always be stronger than our intelligence. We overanalyze, we get overly analytical. If you meet somebody in a conversation, in a context of coaching, you really feel you're connecting to, and you really feel that there's an, an kind of a, a challenge attraction, I call it, where you feel challenged, they push back on you, but it still feels safe and it feels trusted. It goes back to the psychological safety we talked about a little bit. While the relationships build, that's where you know you get to this point potentially very quickly. You got to find a jump off point. Um, and I'll stop here because I mean it, it, we make it more complicated. I think that it needs to be uh, qualifications. If that's you know any kind of a coaching academy or ICF or not. Honestly, I have seen knuckleheads in all of those and i've seen knuckleheads at mit and at harvard and everything else degrees and certificates and graduations and all that stuff uh, in the end you know i have this quote quote out there somewhere on twitter which i said years ago at the tischler center in new york you don't have to be an ivy league graduate to be fucking brilliant and the same thing applies in all categories of life and work and graduate degrees and whatever else it is um, don't get me wrong. There's some amazing people out there who are at Ivy League schools. I know some of them very well, but there's also a lot of not so amazing people at Ivy League schools. I know yeah. a lot of them. Well, well. yeah, I, I equate that with um, cooking. I know I've been to, you know, I I went to cooking school. Jeffrey yeah. has food background. Uh, we know yeah. that there are some great chefs who have never gone to, you know, the Cordon Bleu or anything like that. And there are people 100%. who have who don't. And my dog agrees, um, you know, they they don't have that intuitive feel or the sophisticated taste buds to, to understand flavor profiles and stuff like that. Same thing. And it takes work, right? I mean, yeah. it's like it, as a chef, uh, you know this. Uh, it takes the willingness to experiment. It takes the willingness to talk about it. It takes the willingness to put some stuff out there that maybe even in the context of food polarizing and somebody comes along and says, oh, my God, that's so different. I've never even tasted that. And it's the same thing, you know, I think in, in, in business management and business thinking and management thinking and, and to challenge some of the parameters. I mean, we always talk about, oh, you got to think out of the box. Well, thinking out of the box is actually still thinking in the box, because if I need to think about what my box is to think outside of it, I'm still thinking of the box. So what's the next level? It's impossible thinking. So what is impossible thinking? And we could talk about that a whole another day. Um, Everything's figure outable. That's right. Everything's figure audible. See the invisible, do the impossible, right? There you go. Absolutely. No, this, How do, um, go ahead, Jeffrey. No, you. No, I was just going to say this. Uh, this was so much fun, and I just love the way you look at the um, the the interaction between people. Um, all all three of us work a lot with psychological safety and 
and and all that and the way you come at it is is wonderful and and different and um i'm so glad that you and i got you. got to meet and i'm so glad that you came on the on the podcast this was really great thank information you for me. really great how do people get hold Jeffrey? how do people get hold of you and uh, what's Easy, the best it's way? Just my name stefan tiringer.com or humaninnovationgarage.com they ultimately end up even those two different sites but they'll end up all in the same bucket excellent um and that's a great way to connect i'm on social media linkedin you'll find me under my name as well and uh happy to have a chat or you know explore further whatever we may have tipped on a topic here yes and uh excellent. just just a final question are, are you seeing any patterns in where your business is coming from now is it europe is it the us is it uh global companies uh local companies you know, it's actually really interesting. So I'm starting to get more into Europe as we speak. Uh, we just got uh, with a group I've collaborated with uh, seven other coaches on. We just got an award from the American, uh, from the uh, UK Association of Business Psychologists, where we became a winner for coaching and excellence in regards to change management in a large corporation, uh, which was nice. amazing. We literally just got that, I think, 10 days ago on November 8th. That was congratulations. And so thank you. Um, and so that's where, you know, traction is happening more. I'm working with a couple of companies in Germany, uh, but predominantly for now um, is uh, the United States um, and in Latin America, uh, El Salvador, Guatemala. Uh, but it's yeah, kind of in that corner of the, more, of the world predominantly. Excellent. You're just international. Exactly. No, I love it. You know, it's, I, I, but, but the funny part is I work in Germany. I got to speak English. So uh, that's it, funny because I just can't from the rhetoric and, and from the expressiveness and from the description of the dynamics, I can't do it in German. I sound like I'm five years old. Um, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's quite funny. Quite funny. And is that the that same in Latin funny. America? Is, are we lucky enough to uh, uh, do business in English in Latin America? Yeah. So oftentimes um, it, the, the, it just, it literally just happened um, last week. I was supposed to give a keynote on the 20th in, in Guatemala city. And last minute, they said, you know what? We'd love to have him, but he only speaks English. He doesn't speak Spanish. <laughs> uh, and so uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a choice, uh, and it's interesting. Right. And, and uh, there was a large company, a large beverage company, which is a, a family conglomerate out of, out of Guatemala City. But they decided that even though a lot of their executives are international, the executive language is English. Uh, they decided they want to go Spanish. And I completely understand that. And mm. that's one language that I never learned. I learned French, I learned Latin, which is extremely useful. Uh, and obviously speak German and English. Um, but it's it's one of those things that I never learned. And I, you know, besides like saying good morning and good night and a couple of other things, my Spanish is very limited. So I got to at some point probably practice some immersiveness with Spanish. Absolutely. Yeah. Come to Southern California. <laughs> There yeah, that's true. Yeah, there you go. we have Ola and Huevos Rancheros. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> I can say hello exactly. and have breakfast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I can order tequila. Uh, right there, you go. Yeah. I mean, whoever is Spanish speaking and who's the Spanish council, no disrespect. Uh, absolutely please, please, not. Please, please. absolutely. Uh, not. But no, it's, no, it's no. Just, it's a fascinating language. I love the language, um, and and I have so many friends who are native uh, Spanish speakers, uh, but I've just never, I've just never learned the language. And I honestly, in the in the deepest sense of emotion I really regret that I haven't and and I don't know if at this point I'm going to learn it to a point of uh, fluidity right absolutely right. well anyway excellent well, this has been fantastic Stefan thank you so so much for being here thank that you. is it for us I'm Rona Lewis I'm Jeffrey Hansler and this has been Biz Souls we'll see you next time thank you sir thanks for having me You've been listening to the Biz Souls podcast with your hosts, Rona Lewis and Jeffrey Hansler. Did you have fun? Subscribe, rate, and leave a review. It's very much appreciated. Talk to you next week.